Yeah, that was the other thing. If you get one plus points.
Good morning. It's oh, oh, there we go. Good morning, everyone. Uh, time to get started. I'll call. Go ahead and call the meeting to order. Um, just we, we have enough for quorum, right? Yes, we do. Okay, very good. So Ryan, uh, you go ahead and uh, introduce guests and staff. Okay. Okay. So we uh, do have one new staff member, and I'll let um, okay. Lily and Barbara introduce. Good morning, everyone. My name is Erica Ochoa, and I'm happy to be back at the health district. I was here for two years uh, from 2019, end of 2019 through the beginning of 2022. Um, I am from Toppenish, grew up in Toppenish, Washington, graduated from there, uh, family settled there, uh, doing some agriculture, decided it was a good place to just put some roots down. I've been living here in Yakima for quite some time. I have two little girls um, that I have here in Yakima and school, and I'm excited to be coming back, doing public health within my local community. I stepped away and going to DOH. I was at DOH for about a year doing health education, still very relevant, but I was missing that community part, that tie-in to where I live. So I'm super glad to be doing it again here with you guys, and it's a pleasure to meet you all. Welcome back. Thank you. Yeah. Very good. Thank you, uh, Lillian. I should mention that we need to excuse uh, three of our board members today. Uh, Patricia Byers and Amanda McKinney are out of town. And I know that uh, Stephanie Algram is also, Algren, excuse me, is also excused today. In, in addition, Lupita is not here either. Oh, you're right. Thank you. Yeah, we, we are. We yep, just, we just I think we just barely made it. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Uh, we'll go ahead then and, and move to public comments. Do we have any public comments, Ryan? No, there were no public comments submitted. Okay, and I don't believe we have anybody in person to make public comment that I can see. Okay, very good. Uh, next, we move to the consent agenda. Uh, we need a, we'll need a motion to approve all items listed with an asterisk or no or a dot. Uh, and these include the uh, the board of health meetings for our February meeting as well as the accounts payable. So. Uh, is there anyone that wants to uh, move any one of those items from the consent agenda? If not, we'll go ahead and I'll entertain a motion to uh, approve. Yeah, we approve the consent agenda. Okay. okay, all right. It's been moved by Commissioner Curtis, seconded by Daylene Ackerman to approve the consent agenda. Any con any discussion? Okay, seeing none, all in favor, say aye. Any opposed? Okay, motion carries, thank you. Next, we move ahead to the uh, the district spotlight regarding services across the county. And this is uh, being presented by Lillian Bravo. Okay, very good. Well then by Erica. Stand from here, if this is okay with everybody. Always. Closer. Let's get that right out here. There we go. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Again, my name is Erica Ochoa, and today we're going to be working on looking at the spotlight presentation as our services in a high level throughout the year and taking a specific look at the, our services throughout Yakima County. Now, the Yakima Health District jurisdiction reach is the entire county, which is about 255,000 residents. So with that far of a reach, it's to no surprise that we have a lot of our services offered through our, our environmental health program. On any given day, our EH specialists could be traveling up and down the county, racking up more than 100 miles on these inspections. Now, in the here in the health district, a lot of our services on any given day, you could see our lobbies full individuals coming in to receive their vital records, whether they're needing uh, the immunization records or birth certificates to enroll the kiddos in kindergarten, 
or getting a copy of that birth certificate if they've misplaced it, like myself, um, and other services as well, like coming in on Tuesdays and Wednesdays for our STI services for treatment. Now we're gonna take a look a little bit more of what happens outside of our offices as a lot of our reach happens within our other programs. So we're gonna look at this throughout the seasons um, in, in a year's span. We're gonna start off in winter. Now our behaviors also change as the seasons change and that could also uh, make us more susceptible for different types of uh, conditions or even make us more likely to, to take on new healthier behaviors. In their winter, we are indoors primarily. We're doing family celebrations, holiday celebrations, spending more time indoors, our people's houses, or even at churches. So with that, there could be an increase with respiratory illness and outbreak management is happens a lot during our winter months. So outbreak management could be our flu, COVID-19, and RSV. During this time, we do a lot of communication within our local health clinics, we do that also by doing preventative outreach education using our social media platforms as well, educating the word of prevention as we're celebrating in close quarters. Also during the winter, we're advertising our cold weather shelters. This could be an opportunity for not just the health district, but other organizations to maybe reach our unhoused population to offer other um, forms of intervention for this population. And of course, here uh, in the offices, we're also working on our end of year financials within our accounting staff. And then the spring, as we get a little more sunshine is when things start to get a little bit busier out in our community and also coming in for services. So an increase in environmental health services, we're looking at more land development activity whether that's housing or businesses, more infrastructure requires more use for water and septic. Um, before our permit, before the permits get um, issued out, everyone's calling and needing some of our services here at the health district. Another thing we like to do during the spring is not just our school districts, but also working within other agencies as we do more resource fairs, specifically maybe looking at our DD program that's trying to work within um, students post high school graduation um, that are maybe interested in the, uh, their families may be interested in learning more about employment services. We try to take these months leading up to graduation to answer those questions and make good resources and connections within those schools and families. And of course, with when the summer comes, when the sun starts to shine, we get a little bit more time outdoors. We want to spend more time outdoors. This is the time that we can put our New Year's resolutions to good use use up our parks and trails and get more physical activity. Again, we, we utilize our social media platforms and working with other agencies to promote getting outside and being more physically active. What does DD program mean? Our Dev, uh, Developmental Disabilities Program. Now in the summer, everyone's busy. It's all hands on deck. We are busy at more school events, whether it's wrapping up, getting people ready for, um, getting ready for other activities within our community, also doing um, clinics within, uh, uh, mobile clinics, excuse me, within our other agencies, not just our community agencies, but even local businesses. We were um, set up at a lot of different locations over these last two years as our partnerships and collaborations have grown. We do a lot of different foodborne illness education during the summer. We take advantage that this is when people like to celebrate outdoors. So maybe the way we prepare or maintain our food quality is a little bit more relaxed. We wanna make sure that the education is still there to keep everybody healthy. Increase in water recreation is obviously another thing that happens during the summer. We make sure to get our the pools and water recreation activities prepared for not just our public, but also for those that are coming into our county at hotels, or other gyms or services that offer these uh, water recreation services. And then of course, a big push to come into Yakima County or anywhere else is the food. So temporary food events are also a big push in the summer, having our all of our inspectors from one corner to the county to the other. 
you know, maybe I'm just hungry, but I, that, that uh, inner tube there looks strangely like a Krispy Kreme donut. <laughs> 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 yes. I don't think I had enough for breakfast. <laughs> now in the fall, we're getting ready to go back to school, which means um, making sure our students have had, if they didn't take advantage of the events in the summer for school physicals, catching up on that or immunizations for kiddos zero to 18, um, getting everything wrapped up maybe as soon as we get our flu vaccines in around October, making sure that we are partnering with our clinics and agencies to make sure we are getting those immunizations and information education about the benefits of these. Um, also, there's more seasonal celebrations. We're gonna celebrate our agricultural community with different either wine festivals or hop festivals, which means more food, which means more work for our environmental health department. Now we looked at the year in seasons. Now let's look at how that plays out directly with our valley. Now we're gonna start in the lower valley in the winter. This past year, we had about 50 COVID-19 immunization clinics ranging, so we've got Grandview, Sunnyside, Granger, Toppenish, Swapato, did a lot of work within the Sunnyside community. Like I mentioned, not just with clinics or schools, we even set up at Hapo Community Credit Union as they uh, reached out in partnership over the last two years where it's really been more robust. We set up at a restaurant and of course, uh, a longtime partner of Fiesta Foods. Uh, another thing that we did during uh, the winter in the Lower Valley was one of these emergent issues that happened with our high, higher nitrate levels in our lower valley was doing water distribution um, as we were able to receive funds to have, make sure that this is executed through the end of June. Um, another uh, activity that happened in our lower valley was a walking group started in Sunnyside from our organization, Nuestra Casa. And although it's winter, uh, everyone wanted to start off and do no excuse for physical activity, so they did start in the winter, but as soon as it got a little too cold, they moved it inside to the Sunnyside Mall and they still kept the pace going. And this was brought by them by the Building Resilience and Inclusive Communities Grant. And then lastly, uh, we could also see pictured, uh, we do monthly uh, radio shows at Radio KDNA in Granger. Um, this is an hour long segment targeting specific uh, health issues, whether it's COVID or other emerging topics to our Spanish speaking community. They're able to call in, ask questions live on air and get that response from uh, the Doctora Consuelo and our, our communication specialist, Stephanie, as well. So Eric, I, I've got a question about the radio shows there. Do you, do you get much, uh, uh, is there much call in that happens? From my experience and having done the radio shows before, it varies on the topic um, and it varies on the type of questions. A lot of the times it's more comments, which is actually really great to hear. It's comments or thank yous or suggestions. And I, it's a really good thing to see from our community that says, oh, I see that you're setting up at Fiesta Foods, but hey, how about you come down to Green Grandview or giving us other suggestions and feedback. And it's always great to hear. Thank you. If, I, if I may, uh, Radio KDNA has been a trusted partner, so people feel very comfortable yes. being transparent about their expectations. Very. <laughs> Moving up to the Upper Valley in the spring, like we mentioned previously, this is when we're starting to get ready and getting more services for our environmental health programs. So doing summer camp inspections in the Natchez area getting that ready for all the schools and summer activities that are gonna be happening. We have to uh, do inspections of the kitchens, the water recreation, if, if, if it allows and making sure that the camp isn't gonna be overcrowded so that the kids, youth can have a good experience. Another more physical related activity as well had been working with the uh, Willie Mo Douglas Trail Foundation and helping them with getting an engineer on board to work on a pedestrian bridge, making this trail more walkable and accessible. Um, also, we have pictured here an event that happened in Tayatun with the Highland Community Coalition uh, key leader meeting. We do have, uh, we did have Councilwoman Carrillo present as far as Commissioner Lindy and Commissioner McKinney were also in attendance. Although we may not have programs specifically working um, in every community, what we can do at the health district is maybe provide 
valuable data that could help manage their initiatives if we're not a standalone program within that uh, project. Um, lastly, you could see we also, another emerging issue was the, um, we provided outreach and communication and support with the Department of Health and the Department of Ecology also with the PFAS contamination and ESILA, and those are still continuing efforts. And in the summer, again, super busy there. We mentioned our pools. We have a great vast uh, opportunity for our community members that in any part of the county that they have a pool acceptable. Um, so that's 95 recreational inspections, whether it's public pools, apartment complexes, gym facilities, or hotels. Um, weekly farmers markets events are also taking place, not just here in Yakima Union Gap, down in Granger as well. They've been very successful which means lots of different inspections and permits coming through for uh, food events. National Night Out, uh, Yakima Pride, and other annual long-time standing events. The Yakima Health District always makes an effort to be present, to share the services we have, and then just um, bring some um, joy, have some nice handouts to talk to our communities. Um, and uh, lastly, of course, messaging, again, for safe food preparation. In the last year, we didn't see any major outbreak, and we attribute that to our great communication within our food inspections and then also our social media posts, reminding individuals and making sure they're hot. Hot food is hot, cold food is cold, so everybody could enjoy the summer. Fall in Yakima, again, no time to stop for celebrations. Uh, one of the biggest events also for environmental health inspectors is the Central Washington State Fair seeing well over 70 vendors, each and every vendor needs to be inspected each and every time. We wanna make sure individuals that are coming from different parts of the county or outside of the county to come enjoy any of the events here in Yakima County are doing it securely, they're enjoying the food and they come back every year. Um, mentioned annual, other annual festivals um, related to hops or wineries, same applies. And uh, in the fall again, back to school events, um, we are having um, even one uh, tomorrow no, for spring, making sure in West Valley in partnership with Yakima Neighborhood Health Services. So it's most of the time, as long as we have um, the services available, the staff to help support, we're going to be within our school districts and in the community providing flu, COVID, and other routine immunizations. Um, we have a picture here, another uh, event or pro project that took place in the fall was promoting safer routes to school. They were able to put the triangular beacon um, to help cross the, the children and families on the corner of Ray Street and Fair Avenue, um, accessing their uh, elementary school, middle school, and the park nearby as well. Now with all of the services we do, that's a lot of work for our staff. Happy to do it, working long days, nights, and weekends, as you can see. And at every step of the way, we use our, our strategic goals as a guiding post to make sure that our services are always at their highest standards. Thank you so much for your time. And if there's any questions that anyone here can help answer. Any questions for Erica? I'll just comment on the, some of the temporary food uh, event inspections, just to clarify that um, every food vendor at, at all the different events uh, around the county, everybody gets inspected universally. We don't pick and choose where we go or, or who gets inspected. Um, if you have a temporary food event permit uh, through the health district, um, our vendors expect to get uh, an inspection. That's a service we offer. Um, and we pride ourselves in taking an educational approach that if there, if a vendor is having some issues with um, you know, how they're prepping the food or, or holding the food, we, we work with them to try to fix that issue instead of just you know, blanket shutting people down or, or, or whatever. We might pause their operations temporarily till the issue's fixed, but um, we usually try to, to assist them in, in, in getting it right so that they can continue to operate the event. Just wanted to make that clarifying point. Right. Well, thank you, Sean, and, and thanks for the presentation, Erica. All right, very good. Let's uh, let's go ahead and then move to agency reports. So up first is uh, Executive Director Andre Fresco. 
Thank you, Commissioner Nellity. Good morning to the board and to those watching. Uh, I first wanted to recognize uh, that the reason we wanted to share this concept of the seasonal work is that really our staff are working um, all the time outside in the community. And uh, there's a tendency, I think, for us to talk about services at the, at the health district, but really it is community focused. And uh, we've been able to expand uh, that work in partnership with others. And so the idea of being a catalyst for this kind of work, for this kind of change is important. We can't do this alone without our partners, uh, without community members. And that's why we wanted to share that with you today. I also wanted to recognize Stephanie uh, and Jocelyn. Jocelyn, can you poke your head up? Uh, Jocelyn. <laughs> Jocelyn has been working on, on our water issues, so emergent issues. Stephanie, um, really has been very adept at working on our communication strategy and also being an outlet for people to communicate with. So uh, this is why we're so pleased with the work that we're doing. Um, I wanted to tie that in with our strategic goals. One of the reasons that we always point out our strategic goals is that these are not strategic goals sitting on a shelf. We work very hard to come up with a simple and effective concept, which is what we communicate not only to our team, but also the community, that it is about mandated services that by law we have to provide. It's about community investment and partnerships and increasing our ability to be of service and also making sure that we can continually be uh, working on improving these services so that we can be effective with uh, the people's money, but also be effective at um, using our time, well. which really comes into play because as uh, Sean appropriately mentioned, uh, we are a responsive agents. So if we find out that there's 10 additional temporary food events, then we have to actually have our staff muster and go handle. Uh, but that's the same thing that we've been attempting to do as a template for these uh, other projects that we're working on, like PFAS or issues with groundwater. So we're really trying to say, okay, there's an issue in our community. How can we be effective at working in partnership with others to actually improve people's lives in the, in the event? Uh, what I wanted to touch on today is, uh, and not to steal anything from Chase, but we do, again, have a new funding source and a new uh, partnership concept, which is this foundational public health services investment that the state legislature is making in public health throughout the state. It really has been a 10 to 12 year effort to have uh, a recognition by the legislature that we need additional funding to do our job. For the last 30 years, there's been um, a decrease in funding, which has meant that there haven't been the investments in places like Yakima that are necessary, but also throughout the state. Uh, that's also at the State Department of Health, the State Board of Health, and also with uh, public health with tribes. So working collectively, the public health system has advocated for an investment, and the legislature is accommodating. And that is our foundational public health services money, or what is referred to as FPHS. So that has allowed us to hire people like Erica, allowed us to have increased uh, facilities to have increased funding to pay for projects. Uh, but it's also, I think, our lifeline as we come out of COVID, which is uh, the inevitable reality that the funding for COVID or investments in an emergency will dry up and they won't happen when we want it to. It'll happen when uh, funders decide that we no longer need those money. And my experience in rural America is that traditionally rural communities suffer when mm. the money runs out because they're not traditionally receiving those funds. So the FBHS money allows us to continue to grow, to be um, a responsive agency responding to the needs of the community. And as you can see, we're, we're doing it all the time. Interestingly though, the, we're in a, a unique position where we invested or planned for a use of our foundational public health services funding, but we had so many responses, so many emergency responses over this last year that we actually received additional monies from the state for those responses. So we actually have additional resources. Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, Chase, but we have resources that will um, end at the end of June, June 30. Uh, we receive it July 1st through June 30 each year. Again, we wanted it to fall align differently, but that's not how it worked. Specifically with FPHS money, we are allotted a certain amount of money. And then if we don't use it, it either has to revert to the state again, or it can be used by other health jurisdictions. We're looking to not give money back, but we wanna spend the people's money well. So we are a unique situation currently where we have excess funding that we would not normally had had we not received these other 
um, supports during the year. And we're considering uh, some investments in um, land or buildings because we are reaching our capacity at the health district. We've hired new staff and we recognize during COVID that while we have a wonderful building, which we own as a jurisdiction, uh, we really have some limitations. So as an example, we converted our uh, conference rooms to supply rooms and had pallets up and down all the way up to the ceiling. Uh, we didn't have places to accommodate additional staff when they needed to meet. And certainly we wanna be able to welcome the State Department of Health to come to the east side so that we don't always have to venture to the west side for training. So, uh, you know, Ryan, if you have any thoughts, please share. But we're really um, reaching capacity in this building. So the idea is to see if we can find space within this business park that we can invest. And the goal, and the reason I bring up a foundational public health services is that's state money that is here to support our infrastructure and our ability to provide um, solid foundational services in public health, like communicable disease, preparedness, epidemiology, um, emergency response. So uh, again, we try to um, allocate state and federal dollars well. We certainly want to spend state and federal dollars first before we spend local dollars. Um, and so we're looking at options. I just didn't want to surprise the board with our looking at um, potential expansion issues because uh, it's dependent on our time that we have, when we'd have to give the money back, and also the reality is that um, we're looking to invest for this community for not just now or the next 10 years, but the next 20 to 30 to 40 years of, of appropriate service. So I'm sorry it's vague, but we're really just introducing a concept with end of year dollars and happy to answer any questions if you have any. Yes, Commissioner. Thank you. Is it safe to say that before June, some proposals will be brought to the board as far as how to, how to utilize those infrastructure dollars? Yes, what we're looking at is uh, we have about a half million dollars, uh, give or take. Uh, certainly, I want to defer to Chase in terms of how we use the money over the next few months. Uh, what we would be looking at is either trying to secure a building or land uh, so that we would have options. We, we have a lot of uh, construction happening, and uh, I would certainly welcome having proximity. There's only so many plots of land in this business park that are still available. And we'd like to make sure that if there is an opportunity to buy something that could allow us to expand, that we do so quickly, because once the land's gone, then we would have to build someplace else. Yes, sir. Has any thought been given to having um, infrastructure in the Lower Valley for the Health District? We do want to look at Lower Valley uh, infrastructure, but one of the things that uh, I want to be very clear about is we, we have a tendency to talk about satellite offices. We want to have more of a presence in the Lower Valley, but I'm always a little concerned when we say satellite office because it sounds like an, an extra add-on. If we were to have a location in the Lower Valley, we'd have to have an administrative support there for people. We need to have, I think, an availability to provide services consistently. So uh, we used to have a location in the Lower Valley, but it really was more of a satellite office. And uh, if we were to have a presence there, I'd want it to be a robust presence. But uh, to your point, one of the reasons that we're looking to expand our staff is because we want to expand our presence and specifically in the Lower Valley uh, because there's so many people who uh, deserve our care. Again, one of the reasons that we work so hard on these water projects uh, is that we recognize that there was a lack of services being provided for people who were being affected by uh, public health issues. So you're, you're spot on, uh, but we, we would have to be smart about how we had another location because we want to provide an equal level of service in the Lower Valley. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, I would just like to add that uh, um, well, this is we're kind of in a bit of a lose it or lose it kind of situation, and there's been uh, we've really been in, um, investing in infrastructure and employees really in our main asset. We're kind of running out of room in this building. It's um, kind of getting to that level. So, um, so thank you, Wendell. Oh yes, thank you. Chase brought up a great point. I wanted to share. Um, the public health system as a whole has not had access to this sort of really strong, consistent funding for many years. So the entire state is in a building phase. Uh, there's a tendency for legis legislators to think that this money is only for personnel. 
but you can't hire someone unless you can pay them, unless you can support them, unless they have um, office space. And it's also something that takes a while. So uh, our administrative team led by Ryan, when we hire new staff, it might take three or four or five months to find the quality individual. Mm -hmm. By then you're already halfway through a fiscal cycle. So you end up with monies at the end of the year. What we really are trying to do is to use this investment to strengthen our ability for future uh, initiatives, uh, but it's not, that system is yet to be built at the state level. So thank you for your understanding. And that's all for me, Commissioner, unless there's other questions. Okay. Uh, just a question, Andre, is there currently RFPs out for builders or plans or architects or anything like that for a building? Uh, I think we're premature for that. Um, I, I, the, the opportunity with this end of year money presented us um, a one-time goal of maybe acquiring land so that we could at least have a footprint. Uh, I would be interested if we were going to be building from scratch to consider trying to get an investment from the state, uh, because again, the state doesn't have as much of a presence on the east side as I think they should. If there was a property that was reasonable and we could move on it quickly, that would also be, uh, I think, easier for us. I think construction costs are very high. And I also know from experience personally that um, overseeing a construction project means less time to work on other issues. So I'm, we're, we're, we're very premature in the process, which is why we're bringing it to the board, because again, uh, this is not something we could move on quickly. Also, in fairness, the, the cost of construction has skyrocketed. So uh, we wouldn't move, enter into a construction process lightly because it would be very, very expensive. I'd like to add, you know, up until recently, uh, when the state was looking for budget cuts, it was it was local help that often where that budget was cut. And over the events for the past few years, really seeing a need in investments in local help. And um, that's starting to be more robust. And that's a lot of this is more or less new money for us. And we're looking for ways to we improve our services you know, to, the, to our community. Uh, and one more thing, if I may, we worked very hard to barter, if you will, or position with the legislature to allow us flexibility with how this money was invested. And so we're very, very fortunate that we have options. Uh, traditionally, money that comes from the legislature or the federal government is categorical. So it's around disease prevention or um, diabetes or tuberculosis. This has been very uh, much about building the foundation for strengthened public health services. So we've been able to invest in staffing, technology, uh, things as uh, as simple and straightforward as painting uh, the building, which was necessary. Uh, but it really allows us also to envision uh, an expanded footprint, which again is usually something that is not part of a grant process. So thank you so much. This building is about 15 years old, so we're starting to see a real need for um, updates and for um, you know, improvement, maintenance. And the health district doesn't own this building. Uh, no, we do. You do? Yes, it used to be uh, downtown in the city of Yakima, then the property. And I think we, we sort of bedrocked the um, of Tana Business Arc way before my time. Uh, mm -hmm. But James was still working with yeah. us and, and Ryan. So uh, I think we were one of the first to build here. Uh, the land was inexpensive at the time. And I'm sure it was expensive to build the property. But in hindsight, we made a quality investment because it's, it's uh, to build a building of this size now would be many, many, many times more expensive. So it's owned by the, by the, uh, the health district, the property and the, and the facility. And these things we'll be looking to buy outright. Um, we'll be looking to be able to have, not take out any kind of loans or bonds or any kind of debt. Any other comments or questions? All right. Thank you, Andre. All right. Ryan, uh, Ryan Abak, Chief Operating Officer. Uh, yeah. Okay. So I have two things I want to bring to the attention of the board. One is that we do have four positions that we've been advertising for. And uh, we're going to be doing uh, interviews in the next few weeks. The uh, first position is our epidemiologist position. Uh, two years ago, we created this new position and hired um, uh, Dr. Barrios on for um, a two years temporary position. And that has been very valuable. And we, um, we want to extend that and make that a permanent position. And so 
um, we will be doing interviews for that position and making that a permanent position. So we're pretty excited about moving forward with that. Uh, the other position is our local emergency response coordinator. Last meeting, uh, we said goodbye to Nathan, who is our emergency response coordinator. And so we'll, we'll be doing interviews um, next week for, for that position. Hopefully we'll have someone in that position filled um, soon. And then two other positions that we've uh, created with um, FPHS money is a project coordinator and program manager position. And we'll be um, doing interviews in two weeks for, for those positions. So hopefully you will see new, new staff members here at the board meeting next month or the month after. Any questions on positions? So Ryan, just uh, with Dr. Barris's position, so it's it's becoming permanent. Is she interested in interviewing for the permanent position? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yep. And uh, any other questions? Okay. And then the other the other thing I wanted to bring up is our after action report for COVID. So uh, we did a uh, in December there was an internal survey that was sent out uh, to all staff members for after action report, and then yesterday. Uh, um, uh, after a survey was sent out to all the board members. So just um, make sure that we fill out I mean, any inputs great so that we, we can find out what we did well, what how we can improve um, on any other emergency situations, get that back to us. And then on April 10th, an external survey will go out to all of our external partners. Um, so we just wanted to send that survey out to board members about a week in advance of all of our other external partners. And then by the end of June, we'll have an after action report that will be submitted to the state and also be, be um, sharing with the board. So just on our, excuse me, our timeline of June 30th, we just asked for information of most release all within a week. It was sent out yesterday morning, so this should have been the top of your email <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> Hard to see. <laughs> the first thing you want to do in it. Yes. <laughs> Out the evening before. Okay. <laughs> I was just about to do it and I saw the 20 minutes. I said, oh, okay, I'll get back to that. Oh, that's right. I do remember this now. Okay. All right. It is, I'll get it is investment in public health. That's right. <laughs> okay. That's all I have. All right. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, next up, we have a report from our health officer, Dr. Barg. Floor is yours. Good morning. Before I get started, I just want to say that uh, the best defense against future outbreaks and the kind of problems we saw with COVID is strong health district and these funds and other infrastructure stuff will help us when the next one comes, not if, just when. Uh, the other thing that happened uh, in my short time here, nothing to do with me, but just the fact that happens is DOH and Yakima Health District and other health districts seem to be working together a lot closer. There's some coordination of efforts. This is a really, really good thing. And on the monthly health officer meetings that we used to have weekly, uh, DOH is always sitting in. There's somebody from DOH doing that, and that uh, facilitates um, communication back and forth. And I think some of those efforts have been joint decisions instead of just one side or the other. There's been cooperation and collaboration, which is also a really good thing. Now, to show you how closely the health district and the health officer work together is I have a scientific presentation explaining all the things that were just talked about. So if you wonder why nitrates are bad, I'm going to tell you. Okay, so can we have the first slide? All right, so uh, this PA, PFAS, everybody's hearing about it. You know, just what is it? You know, why is it a problem? So it's a forever chemical. It means once they make it, it doesn't go away. If it gets into the environment, it doesn't, it doesn't degrade. It's used primarily as a fire retardant at the, at the base. And then, of course, you know, the rain comes, even though it's not very frequent, it washes off, it gets into the groundwater. And wherever the plume of the groundwater normally flows, this substance goes with it. So PAF, PFAS stands for per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. So that's why they call PFAS. And just a little background, I, I also want to add is there's nothing in this slide that anyone can't find on the website, right? Because that's where I got it, on the website. <laughs> so uh, in June, the Army was testing drinking water from private wells. And uh, in addition to other things, they, they looked for concentrations of the PFAS substances and they found them in some wells. So the households that were at risk were told about it and notified they were encouraged to use other sources of drinking water and they are being supplied to those uh, areas. Next slide. This is a nice picture taken from the website. 
and helps explain uh, where these things get into our systems. So if it like Teflon pots and pans, you know, we love those, but they have PFAS in them. Drinking water, brushing your teeth with bad water, preparing baby formula with bad water, meaning PFAS is in it. Next slide. So this slide just shows some of the different places that uh, PFAS is included. So it's food packaging, nonstick cookware, outdoor clothing that's waterproof or water resistant, firefighting foams, carpets that have stain resistance in them, and products that resist grease and water and oil. Basically, this is Teflon, anywhere Teflon is used or uh, the sorts of stuff that are sprayed on clothing to make a waterproof also has Teflon in it. Next slide. Dr. Bard, if I could uh, interject, uh, is it still being used? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, if I, you go buy a raincoat tomorrow from REI, you okay. probably have water, DWR, durable water resistance, that's uh, added to the fabric. The concentration levels are different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, keep in mind is we don't drink raincoats. Yeah. So, so, yeah, I mean, it, that, if it's outside view, it's okay. It's only that's a good thing. Yes. View. Dr. Barr, why would it be used in food packaging? That seems like an ironic place to use. My only guess, I don't know for sure, but my guess would be so the packaging doesn't stick to the food substances. Hmm. Has fire retardant today changed? Because I noticed even in the fire out in the U.S., it's over houses. They put retardants over houses. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't know what they use in general. Sean, do you know? Uh, I believe uh, AFFF, which is the firefighting foam that contains PFAS, has been banned in the state of Washington since 2014, I believe, only in extreme emergencies, um, such as large forest fires, can it be approved for use. But there are alternative uh, firefighting retardants that are uh, do not contain PFAS. Yes, and if, if I may also add, uh, that was really that foam, that retardant foam was used in all major airports and also sprayed whenever you had a mm -hmm. spill of something potentially that could ignite, so oil or gas. And so what you saw often was contamination in those sites for things like oil and gas, which were then moved to um, solid waste facilities that could manage that. So you actually had um, many different areas for exposure. It was banned. What we're now finding over the years, and that's the federal government has been slow to keep up with this, and that is that these are forever chemicals that have now exposed water sources. Next slide. So again, from the website, there are a list of things that can be done to protect yourself, minimize the consumption of water or other food products that contain the chemicals. You can put filters in the tap water and well water that will help extract it. Um, <clears throat> uh, follow fish advisories. And, you know, there's somebody's uh, not connected to PFAS, but there's recommendations out to limit them on fish you eat because of mercury that's in there worldwide. Um, and reduce uh, other products that use the chemicals and find alternatives. Next slide. Uh, so the, what happens with PFAS? Why, why is it a problem? So they can increase cholesterol levels. So uh, those of us that are eating a lot of red meat, you don't want to get near PFAS either. Then you'll have really high cholesterol, decreased immune response to vaccines, changes in liver enzyme that would suggest that there's liver cell damage, uh, increased risk of thyroid disease, increased risk of testicular and kidney cancer, blood pressure problems during pregnancy, and decreased birth weights on uh, newborns. So none of this is very good. Next slide. All right, now shifting over to nitrates. Um, there's, the, what I wanted to do is just tell you why they're bad. So they're in fertilizers, manure, uh, liquid waste discharged from septic tanks, and the natural bacteria that exist in soil can convert uh, nitrogen to nitrates. Um, once it rains or is irrigation spray, <clears throat> they can carry the nitrates <clears throat> into the uh, soil and groundwater. And then since it's in the groundwater, if a well <clears throat> is used to get drinking water, it may contain nitrates. And the Washington's drinking water quality standard is see seen there. And I think it's still true that the state's uh, levels are, are not are the same as the county levels. Is that true? Mm -hmm. Okay. But not so with PFAS. 
Right, the state action level is different uh, for PFAS than the federal uh, right. lifetime limits. All right, next slide. So nitrates are health hazard. And one of the biggest problems it causes is it stops red blood cell ability to carry oxygen to the cells. And it's worse in kids because they, in uh, newborns, because they can't uh, recover from it as quick as adults can. So infants with uh, that you, uh, drink water that's high in nitrates can develop a, a disease called methemoglobinuria. So that, modification to the hemoglobin does not allow it to carry oxygen. And as a result, the babies look blue, but the blue baby syndrome. Uh, there's other problems there uh, that are listed, but again, they're all on the website if you want to check them. So for the sake of time, we'll, we'll move on. But methemoglobinuria is, or methemoglobinemia is the worst of them. Next slide. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Um, I'm just curious, are we required or does the health district um, routinely check school districts or school water levels for nitrates or is that not something we do? It's not something we've done um, recently as most, uh, most of our schools are on uh, municipal water systems that are tested by the state. Uh, and any uh, school that is served by a drinking water well would fall under a um, group A uh, non-transient water system which would also be uh, tested by the state, I believe, quarterly. So right on. they are being tested, but not by us. It's, it's a, oversight is by DOE, State Department of Health. Uh, Melissa, do you mind again mentioning, again, in terms of uh, the concerns for babies, what we do in terms of oversight? So it's not a notifiable condition in the state of Washington, but our health officer, previous health officer, Dr. Spitters, uh, required it in Yakima County that um, for Dr. Bart pronounced it really better than me. It's a methemoglobinemia. <laughs> but that's required to be reported by the hospitals or laboratories physicians in Yakima County. So I've got a question about that. Uh, my understanding is that uh, we haven't had any reported cases of this uh, here locally. Do we know cases of it throughout the state or nationally? I don't know, that, but, there, but there probably, there's probably yeah. databases that have it. It used to happen much more frequently previous decades. Uh, hmm. So we do have high nitrates here. And one of the reasons that we're part of the groundwater management area advisory committee and uh, so invested in these conversations is that we do have nitrate levels that are um, increased in certain areas um, within the uh, uh, but we haven't seen um, occurrences with children being affected to that degree. Yeah. Could the hospital report it if one was born? Yeah, for for Yakima County. Okay. All right, next slide. Um, so in order to help deal with this, uh, as we've already spoke about, there's ongoing surveillance of the well waters, and then there's also special education programs that the health district um, has uh, made available to the uh, owners of wells. Okay. Next slide. Well, our favorite topic recently is landfill. And just some, again, a little bit of the science. Why is it bad? Besides the smoke going into the air, there's toxins that can be re, uh, released by the consumption of the uh, materials that are making the fire up. One of the um, problems with this current landfill issue was hydrogen sulfide. And that's a gas that smells like rotten eggs. And the problem with hydrogen sulfide is when you smell it, the concentrations are low, so they're not dangerous. When they get higher, you don't smell it, and then it becomes dangerous. So the uh, owners of the landfill tried very hard to suffocate the fire by putting tons of dirt over it, which isn't a guarantee because there's lots of airspace in a, in a landfill. Uh, there's just air trapped between two by fours and sheets of plywood and everything else. So it's difficult to eliminate all the channels. So because of that, there's ongoing monitoring uh, that Sean's been involved with. And there's been a, there was a partnership between multiple agencies, uh, the Health District, Department of Ecology, and Yakima County Clean Air, uh, and I guess EPA eventually. So everybody's out there testing and trying to figure out the best way to deal with it. And there's some recent out, uh, toxic gas being released 
a new one, benzene? Uh, yeah, recent recent sampling through a more robust sampling effort. Um, there were some uh, releases of gas for ambient air, which are methanol, ethanol, toluene, and benzene, which are all products of uh, combustion and combustion of um, uh, potentially petroleum products. So um, there's some concerns around that, and we're we're getting the data confirmed um, and reevaluated before we um, know what the next steps will be. But yeah, there are some concerns with some gas releases. And that's something the health district very much wanted was ongoing monitoring. And that's what's going on. And this is a good result. It's bad to have it there, but it's good that we know about it. Next slide. Uh, this is just a little table showing you what concentrations of hydrogen sulfide can do. So at 0 0.008 um, parts per million, uh, that's where you smell it. And uh, when it gets up to 20, then you can have neurologic effects, including memory loss and dizziness. So I'm just wondering how often I come in contact with hydrogen sulfide. <laughs> but, uh, I, I'm pretty sure this is a table on the health, in the health district website as well. Uh, if not, I found it very easily. But next slide. Arm reduction, needle exchange, ongoing project, at least 20 years old, Melissa. Yeah, and uh, we've talked about this before, so I won't I won't get into details. But the whole the whole benefit of this is to decrease transmission of hepatitis C, hepatitis B, and HIV, and all of these can cause chronic disease of uh, quite high severity. And um, I won't go into the details of that, but happy to talk to anybody that wants to know the long term outcome of these three infections. And uh, just for one example, hepatitis C goes on to a chronic phase can cause cirrhosis, and it's about $250,000 to transplant a liver, uh, which is the only way you can treat this if you go to end-stage liver disease. But this also has become increasingly a pathway to drug treatment. So people that present to needle exchange can now be talked to and uh, encouraged to uh, attend drug treatment programs. Mm -hmm. I think that one of the limitations here, we just don't have enough drug treatment sites to accommodate the people who uh, need help. Um, On-site STD testing for syphilis is going on, and I don't have an exact number. Do you have an idea how many cases were picked up in needle exchange, Melissa? Two, so far, since we started in December. Okay, and with an ongoing outbreak um, in, the, in the town, two of these found and treated, the chain gets longer if it's uh, uninterrupted. This interrupts that chain of, uh, of um, transmission. So on-site on testing for fentanyl uh, purchased um, and locally uh, can save lives because if people uh, aren't uh, aware that fentanyl's in there, they might take it and uh, overdose, which has been happening at an alarming rate. And also Narcan's available at the sites. Um, for people that uh, are afraid of overdosing or, you know, I don't think have any overdoses at the site, it's just needle exchange, but it can happen soon after. Dr. Bark, uh, the on-site testing for fentanyl, what does that look like? It's a fentanyl it? testing strip so that individuals can um, test their, their substance for fentanyl. They don't do it there at the syringe program, but the idea is that they will change their yep. behavior. If they'll use less, they'll make sure they have someone with them, but they have our pattern they just won't use it all as the goal um but just to decrease the overdosing yeah but it's a take-home test yeah. that you take you're not testing the drugs at the correct okay yeah. never <laughs> it, it'd be no. unlikely to actually bring drugs to the site it's not made as a site to use drugs it's made as a site to prevent drug use that's good I saw this morning, uh, uh, Dr. Barg, that uh, the FDA just cleared uh, Narcan for over-the-counter distribution without a prescription. Yeah. That's probably a wonderful step forward. Absolutely. So it used to be that you could walk into a pharmacy without a prescription. The pharmacist could give it to you. Uh, I think in the summer, it'll be available at the drugstore. You just go and buy it like you can aspirin. Not, not to get too far off topic, but I have had folks tell me that you can abuse Narcan as far as is still getting a high off of Narcan. Is there any truth to that? Okay. <laughs> no, I, I, I don't mm -hmm. think there's any connection at all. I think the idea is that um, the concern in, in fairness is this idea that you can always batch 
yourself before you have a fatal problem, and that is not true. So it is, it is not to be, it is not a situation to get into in the first place. Next slide. So vaccine clinics, as was talked about, very effective. And I don't know how widespread that is. I think it's somewhat unique that we go to the places where people work and make it easy for them to get the vaccination. And that was true with COVID. And I think influenza has just been approved to do that as well. Um, we had this amazingly quickly put together monkeypox vaccine uh, initiative and neighborhood health and farm workers uh, used their uh, facilities to um, administer this and it went very well. So it, was, it wasn't quite anonymous because the pe people at risk, but it didn't go outside of the people at risk. Uh, so uh, I think 50 to 100 people might have been vaccinated throughout this. And that contributed, was a contributor to the sort of cessation of the epidemic. So it's still, there's still cases. They're being reported, they're getting into different populations, but uh, we haven't had a case here. I guess we had five initially, and we've had no further cases identified. Yeah. So the, one of the reasons that taking the vaccines to the remote areas is good because there's anonymity. People don't have to like go to a clinic and say what they need. In the case of monkeypox, that would be uh, an issue, but it just makes the whole thing easier. It makes it safe. And then the healthcare providers have experience or administering the vaccine. So next slide. Uh, they talked a little bit about this funding. I have to say these blinkers, uh, if you, you've seen them, there's one on 40th Street at a very dangerous crossing at Chestnut and 40th. And I use that a lot to ride my bike out. And having those blinkers there is, is a really huge safety improvement. If you're in a car and you're making a turn and you're looking for other cars, you are not looking for pedestrians, you're not looking for bicycles, mm -hmm. these blinking lights are a huge improvement. And these other things that were talked about already, we'll, we'll move on. Next slide. All right, so Dave stole my thunder. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you know about the naloxone spray. And coming up in early April, I think the DOH is going to um, stop uh, wearing or at least offer the uh, opportunity to stop wearing masks in healthcare facilities. Uh, the um, health district directors um, met at the last meeting. Uh, we decided that the most important thing is to still wear a mask when you're patient facing because the, you're seeing people in hospitals and in clinics are at risk. They're coming in there because they're sick. So the risks are the highest. We tried to figure out how could you implement that? And there was no real way you could implement that well. This easiest thing to do is just to have people wearing masks. So what some of the hospitals in Seattle are doing is they're extending the mask wearing for healthcare providers in healthcare facilities for three months and then reevaluating. I don't know what the hospitals are going to do here yet. Uh, I'll probably talk to at least Memorial and see what they want to do. And uh, if Astria wants to talk about it, I'd be happy to discuss it with them. But it's trying to be as safe as you can with people that are as high risk as they can be. And, you know, it's, it's as things still decrease, it'll get better and better as far as risks uh, in maybe another three months, maybe in six months but it'll be a three month to three month decision-making for the big hospitals in Seattle. And maybe it would be good if we follow that example. Well, Melissa will have more to share in her report. Okay. And that's it for my, uh, my report today. All right, thank you. Any questions for Dr. Barg? Daylene. Um, <clears throat> some questions on the PIFAs. Um, the, so I've, I've read that there are some issues with some absorption. I don't know if it's from clothing or the materials so much, those may be more bound, but like cosmetics or things like that, that, that you can absorb it through your skin. Have you heard that? I haven't, but I'm sure it sounds plausible. Sean, do you know? What I do know is that it, the concentrations are, are so much lower than, uh, you know, the instance in East Silo where it's actually in being found in the aquifer and the absorption rate is is much lower than consuming contaminated drinking water or um you know consuming food grown in a garden that's being watered with contaminated drinking water so 
uh, the the main concern um, is consumption. Is the ingestion. Yeah. It, 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 so it talks about packaging. So are the you know the plastic bottles that the water come in? Or, I mean, have those been looked at or tested? And then the water within it. You know, you hear mm -hmm. that not all bottled water is equal. <laughs> That some companies are, <clears throat> you know, a little more um, careful about the the quality of water they put in. So, have have the has the bottled water been tested? Um, I know there are several companies that do quality control on their drinking water for uh, for PFAS. Um, I haven't looked at a lot of the research around that, as our efforts have been more focused on um, more finding resources for people in terms of filtration and, and treatment for their drinking water well. Um, however, uh, the, the Army does have a contract in place with the water distributor. Um, so I would would hope that that's been confirmed that it's PFAS free, but I can, I can look into that. I've also um, read that distilling will take care of the problem is, you know, are you guys giving that information to people too, to say, hey, you could distill water and um, take care of that issue with your own water why well, do we're not we're this is different than boiling water right this is different so um i don't know what the capabilities that a lot of folks would have for that but um we are communicating that simply boiling the water will not right. take care of the problem but the same as nitrates you know it's in there it's in there you can't boil it out filtration is is the the solution there um, but how readily prepared people are to conduct a distillation process that would be effective, I, I think, is um, beyond a lot of folks' capabilities without purchasing necessary equipment. But yeah. so that hasn't really been a targeted approach as of yet. But it could be worth some additional research that we yeah. we can look into it. Yeah, from what I've read, because you, I mean, depending on the quantity, but just if you wanted to address drinking water in the home. That's pretty uh, actually reasonably done. I mean, um, like a countertop, even just a small mm -hmm. distiller um, isn't terribly cost prohibitive, but it, it does take care of a lot of those contaminant mm -hmm. issues. And there's there's a lot of over the counter uh, filtration systems. Uh, I I don't want to say, for example, similar to a Brita type uh, system where you have a one gallon or two gallon jug, you fill it up and uh, it filters the water on the way out. Some of those filters have been proven effective to reduce the amount of, of PFAS uh, in drinking water. So there's, a, there's more research being done around that as uh, an alternative until a more permanent filtration system can be uh, made available. Ms. Ackerman, I'm not certain that there's PFAS in the plastics used for water bottles, but uh, we have found and, and have read many reports uh, that people shouldn't reuse disposable plastic water bottles because they have they shed plastic, and that's why people shouldn't, as an example, leave a water bottle, uh, store bought um, disposable water bottle with water in their car in high temperatures because again it it will it will shed plastic. So the consumption of plastic, again, is something I think that many people don't think about, but there are particulates in that water sometimes. The question is, what is that, what is that harm level going to do long term? But that's an issue separate from the issue of PFAS. Uh, Sean, just a quick question. Before the prohibition on the use of PFAS and some of the fire retardants, are we seeing, a, since the prohibition, are we seeing a decrease in the amount of concentration in the water supply, or are we seeing effects from our environmental rules that we've put in place, or most of the contamination I take place, I, I would imagine, took place before they were monitoring, mm -hmm. uh, because there was no monitoring, and therefore you were contaminating at will. But since that, have we seen any point of inflection? That's a great question, and to be honest, I don't know. Uh, the the uh, the information around PFAS as being a, a known contaminant and a contaminant of concern is so new. There's so much research still being done on that. So new that the EPA is updating their lifetime exposure limit from 70 part per trillion to 
rumors have it as low as 0. 0.0004 part per trillion lifetime exposure limit. And the struggle with that is the best tests, water sample tests that we have can detect down to two parts per trillion. So a non-detect very well could mean you're still above a lifetime exposure limit in drinking water. So it's all very new. And there's only been one uh, sampling effort done in the East Sela area uh, from the Department of the Army. They did three phases, you know, branching out further and further and further. And they got to a point where they saw less percentage of overall wells affected by PFAS. Still, there's concern that they didn't reach the end of the, of the contamination plume. And there's, there's a lot of agreement among local and state uh, folks that there needs to be ongoing sampling efforts to, to start getting that trend of, are, is contamination still going up? Are we starting to see a downfall? Is, is the aquifer starting to push some of that those contaminants out since you know it hasn't been used for several years but there was a lot of firefighting foam used um you know pra uh, they have an airport uh, they blow stuff up practice putting out fires um and a lot of this stuff is also windblown when they get into the soil so surface soil can be blown around and that can contribute so how vast the issue is is still relatively unknown um we know approximately how far the contamination plume is going. We do have a pretty good natural barrier uh, with the river there and, and uh, the Sela Gap, but uh, is that going to stop it? We don't know yet. So there's just a lot of unknowns that are still being talked about and there's still a lot of um, discussions that these things need to, have, need to happen and be carried out. Um, and uh, Sela is not unique. I mean, there's army bases all over the country. Oh, Are there other issue, places yeah. where they've seen this same contamination from similar practices? And if so, is there any data on any of those? Are the is this the canary in Sela, or is there others that are farther along in the process? Oh, this is a nationwide issue. A lot of airports, a lot of military uh, installations have these issues. Um, they're in the state of Washington, I believe. It's in San Juan or Island County. There was a contaminated area uh, over in Spokane. There's a contaminated area that's similar to the, the you know, East Sela, um in nature. So uh, we're not alone in this. And we are, you know, trying to pull out the useful findings of these other contaminated areas that could benefit our response um, uh, in this case. Um, but the Army is the lead agency on this. Uh, so they're they're driving it. Um, what we're doing is we're partnering with Department of Health to try to help the individuals that are currently under or are under the current federal lifetime exposure limit of 70 part per trillion. Because our state action level is 10 part, 10 part per trillion. And I believe we have about 35 wells that uh, tested below the federal limit, but above the state. So we're working to bring resources there and uh, uh, relief there and also talking about how can we repeat these sampling efforts to number one get a, a trend going on on the contaminants are they going up going down staying stable and how far does the plume actually go and dr atterbury I, I think that you're bringing up an interesting point when we say forever chemicals we're talking about them being in your body they're in the water it means there's forever chemicals that have been there for many years in dirt. And that issue of remediation has not even been addressed yet. And, and as you're pointing out, uh, it's the federal government often that was using these or municipalities that were using these. So who's responsible for that remediation has not even been addressed yet. And if you said that they haven't gone out far enough in the plume, is the intent to go further out and check wells? I have not heard um, what what the any further intent is on on expanding the sample area, but I know it's being discussed at the state level uh, and you know amongst with our meetings with the State Department of Health and Ecology that is what they would like to see happen. But no indication from the federal government yet on what their plans are. They're following a process called CERCLA, which is um, when there's a, a some sort of contaminant 
or, or emergency uh, response to an environmental issue, that's the process they're legally, they legally have to follow. Uh, and it, it can take some time. So they're aware of it though. <laughs> Is there any interest in the health district doing that testing ourselves to expand on the plume or is that not something that would be costly well uh the the tough thing again is is staff time and and cost i mean a a, a test uh for pfos pfoa to to get the whole spectrum of what you need to test for to come up with what is the concentration of of pfos in drinking water because it's many different compounds um it's five six hundred dollars bless you for one test and for one test wow. and uh i think we've already there's already been over 300 wells sampled uh in the east sila area so would we need to sample another 100 wells 200 wells 300 wells uh to expand the area i think going out further would be less is more attainable than resampling everybody's already been sampled but that also needs to be done. So man hours and 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 funding are are a huge factor in that. It's not a small project to take on. Correct. Yeah, and those that are above the current federal lifetime limit are are um, having bottled water delivered um, by the by the federal government, and we are working on a. Um, initiative for uh, drinking water filters for th folks that are above the state action level and below the federal lifetime limit. So we're bringing resources to the people that are um, still being affected by this, but don't necessarily qualify based on the federal guidelines. Right, yeah, absolutely. That is, that is still a concern. That again is, testing more wells and, and growing this area of concern to see where where does the plume end? How far is it? And, uh, and Commissioner, and, and, and certainly uh, these questions are helpful to us. That's why we're doing so much communication with community members while we're involved in it. But it's uh, this small agency is in an interesting position where we do not have the jurisdictional authority for some of these response issues. And so these discussions are actually at the state and federal level, which makes it very complicated because, again, it's not just an issue affecting our community, it's affecting the state, it's affecting the nation. Uh, this is where we find ourselves often. It's the same thing that happened with Guama, where we were coming together in partnership to address issues that are longstanding. And from a jurisdictional issue, we don't have authority. We don't have the legal position to mandate things. So we work in partnership, but it is a slow process. And we we do have some ability to expand on on our knowledge of the area as new well users do uh, drinking water source community water systems things like that have to go through a, a sampling process and <clears throat> over um, water right or approval of a community water system there is some ability to uh, uh, look at some sample results and add PFAS as an analyte to water testing to make sure that they're not being negatively affected. And if they are, uh, provide you know information resources that they could install an effective uh, treatment system uh, or filter that would uh, alleviate that issue. Because uh, by state law, uh, a drinking water source cannot be approved if there's a, a known contaminant of concern in the air without sampling for that contaminant. Sean, have we had any recent dialogue with the military or has there been about next steps that they're looking at taking in this regard? Like expanding um, the circle of testing or? Not with the health district directly, but there is quite a bit of dialogue going on between the Department of Ecology and uh, the Department of Defense and Department of Army. I believe the, excuse me, uh, Department of Ecology issued an agreed order um, for work for the army to do and when they did not sign that there was a, um, a notice of, of enforcement um, issued by ecology to get some conversations going so i don't know what that looks like i'm not privy to those meetings but certainly seem like an uptick in people bringing in water here um, we got to direct them towards cascade labs for actual testing 
I mean, but the community is becoming more and more aware of this, and I'm seeing a lot of residentials doing their own testing. And we do have on our website and flyers and information we're passing out, information on labs, a list of labs that are capable of uh, running water samples for, for folks. All right. Well, a robust discussion regarding PFOS. Thank you for your report, Dr. Barg. Right. Uh, next on the list, we have the financial report from Mr. Chase Porter. Okay. Uh, the, the financial start on page 10 in your Board of Health packet. So we're reviewing through the month of February. And so the month of February, we had a gain in excess revenue of, of approximately $487,000. Uh, bringing the gain for the year to three hundred fifty-five thousand uh, dollars for revenue. Our allocated budget through the end of February was one point six million dollars, and our actuals are coming in really close to that one point six. For expenditures, um, our budgeted allocated budget for February was around one point seven million, and our actuals expenditures are coming around around one point two million dollars. Any questions on the summary? I'm going to move rather quick, and if there's any questions, please feel free to interrupt me. Um, so, moving into the income statement, the large gain on the month has um, the main the main driver in that is our investment income. You can see there was a half a million dollar gain in investment income. Um, there was major uptick this month in that. Um, our investments handled Yak by Yakima County Treasurers, and so um, they're doing a good job investing our money. It seems to be. Throughout expenses through the month or for the year, we're coming in below budget for the majority of our expenses. Uh, moving into the last page of the income statement, page 12. I'd just like to direct your attention towards the FPHS funding. Um, this is 2023 or 2022 funding that we're, we're using in 2023. Uh, so for the month of February, uh, we used $200,000, $202,000 of FPHS funding. Uh, so we have just about $47,000 left to spend in 2022 funding before we start getting into 2023 FPHS funding. Are there any questions regarding that? All right, moving into program specific. Um, again, there's not a lot, a lot to note here. As you can see, um, with the FPHS funding, we're showing a loss for all of those, but that's because we're using prior year you know, money for that. Questions around program specific. Um, next page, page 14, uh, we're showing a loss on, on the solid waste project and on site. Um, a lot of that has to do with um, seasonal activities. So February is still very much in the, the winter season. We'll start seeing an uptick in those programs as we move into spring and summer. Any questions about programs? Uh, actually, really quick, uh, back on page this sheet here, the, the, sure. uh, line 730 marijuana prevention and education, those dollars, those are just dollars that the health district is yeah. using uh, from your general fund. No, we actually have a grant with that. Um, we actually work with Walla Walla. Um, it's a state grant from Walla Walla that we um, are being reimbursed for our services. Um, so that is, we have direct funding for, for marijuana and tobacco. Right. Thank you. Those are education? Yeah. Educational, okay. Education prevention. Okay. Any other questions regarding the program? Next page is our COVID. Um, that's, that's not a lot to note there. 39,000, uh, mainly on um, uh, payroll wages. Payroll expenses. The last page of our report is our cash flow. Uh, for the month of February, we had um, $4.5 million in, um, in cash and cash equivalent. Good questions. Chase, apparently not. Thank you. Thank you, Chase. All right, so uh, next up, uh, disease control. Melissa Sixberry, please. Today, so. <laughs> <laughs> it is warm in here. <laughs> uh, I always report on our TB cases, so we currently have three active TB cases that we're managing. We discharged one earlier this month, but we did acquire a new active TB case. 
Um, so working on that, the Department of Health reached out to us yesterday, and sure it here is our uh, the, the platform that we use that we actually have been using for five or six years that DOH has now um, linked up with and is now offering throughout the state. We were kind of the pilots for the program and tested it. They're now wanting to do a pilot for a new feature, and so they reached out to us to see if we'd be interested. I don't quite know what the new feature is, but it's just great to be part of and thought of to try out new software and, and bettering the, the, the program for that. Um, I'll just add to what Dr. Barr said. So the the Secretary of Health had for COVID has is rescinding his order for requiring masks in correctional facilities, long-term care facilities, and healthcare facilities effective April 3rd. The State Department of Health, however, has not changed their guidance. They're currently working with um, CMS and other licensing agencies to determine what guidance they're going to follow and like, what recommendations they're going to use. Um, I haven't, I reached out to them the other day, but I haven't heard back. I'm still waiting for updates. April 3rd is quickly approaching and everyone is asking what's going to happen, um, but they have instructed us to, con to continue uh, wearing masks in those facilities until we hear otherwise. Um, and so that'll, that we have typically um, all the state's guidance when it comes to COVID. So I'm sure with Dr. Barr will align with whatever the state's guidance is on that. And then um, I just wanted to report out for our, our harm reduction program uh, with the referral system that we have out there for treatment. For March, there, were, there was um, a referral uh, individual out there twice so far this month. She'll be out there again tomorrow, but has already for this month had 29 referral um, encounters and four referrals for treatment for March. So Melissa, just to follow up on that, so is that, so you have someone on site who can refer to uh, treatment centers. Is this, is this new or is this ongoing? ongoing. The, it, several years ago, um, Comprehensive had a program called Hub and Spoke, and it, and it allowed for them to be able to have an individual out at our syringe service program to, to develop a report, connect people to services for treatment, et cetera. Um, and then COVID happened, the funding went away, the staffing wasn't available. Um, but they did um, agree to have a, an individual out there for us as much as they can, as much as staffing allows. Um, so it's usually, she's out there usually two to three times a month. Okay, so it's not a, it's not a constant present, but they're there as they can be from time to time. That's yeah. The individual that's out there has had her own um, FMLA kind of things going on. To, of course, she hasn't been able to, but usually it's, there's a presence out there every week. And are you seeing, I'm sorry, are you seeing any trends there? I mean, is this, are you seeing more referrals, less referrals, and it's kind of steady or? Um, I think it's pretty steady. We, it was post, post COVID, we didn't really get this ramp back up until December, um, but I, I think we've had a great response since then. And I think the difference is we have a, uh, we have an individual out there who has lived experience. And I think that makes all the difference when connecting with these individuals. Sure, peer to peer conversation. Yeah. Okay. Yes, we're really supportive okay. of peer navigation. We think that creating that trust relationship is necessary and reaching people when they are interested in uh, receiving care is is vital because, again, people have uh, an interest in it, but I think that it quickly fades um, when they don't have the support. So we're trying to actively have and engage more uh, organizations to assist us with that. Are we happy to talk to you after? Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Thank you. Appreciate that. Any questions, other questions for Melissa? Okay, thank you. Uh, moving along then, uh, environmental health, Sean McGee, you are back on stage. <laughs> <laughs> Happy to be here. Good morning, everybody. Um, so as, as Chase mentioned in the financial report uh, for our on-site uh, drinking water uh, programs, we are starting to see that uptick uh, for the busy season as the weather improves so do our land development activities. So we're, uh, we're mobilizing pretty heavily to, to respond to the needs of uh, our community in the land development arena. Uh, we do have a lot of training going on. Uh, as most of you know, a lot of uh, the environmental health staff are, are, um, have been here less than two years. A requirement of our environmental health program is that they become registered sanitarians uh, within the first two years of hire. And uh, happy to announce that we have two more people who are signed up and, and studying to take that exam. So we're 
we're moving forward and making progress on uh, achieving uh, our staff all being registered sanitarians, which is the goal. So that's that's the some good news there, and as far as our training and staff development. Some of the bigger ticket items in environmental health is we have a couple deadlines we're working with on our two privately owned limited purpose landfills. We have some re permit renewal dates coming up. Um, we're working uh, with both of these landfills very closely, having regular meetings and discussions on required documents and information that we need for review uh, to effectively renew the permit, as uh, there's been a lot of, of changes and operational uh, increases at these facilities um, over, over the last year or two. Um, and then with the other issues, such as we've had the fire at the one facility, um, you know, looking at operations plan that are conducive to uh, not promoting more fires. So doing a lot of reviewing, a lot of discussions, and really trying to, to, to work quickly to, to get all these things in place to effectively renew their permits. Um, so um, we're, we're working heavily on that right now as well. And I believe that's that's all I have to cover at this this time. Oh. Huh? oh, yes, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, one one other uh, uh, piece of news is that we, um, uh, Stephen is one of our environmental health specialists. Uh, he's been here a year and a half now. He's our solid waste lead, and we received a recommendation for him to be nominated for uh, environmental health uh, rookie of the year for uh, the Washington State Environmental Health Association. Uh, so that would be that nomination um, will move forward and we will get a result at the annual education conference in May to see if he's awarded that. But we are going to move forward and nominate Stephen for a rookie of the year award. Well, very good. He's yeah. off, obviously off to a good start then, isn't he? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Hearing rookie of the year makes me feel very, very old. <laughs> but I, I did want to affirm something, which is that we have been very fortunate to have people who are interested in being in public health and interested in serving the community. They have a, a service um, heart and uh, and they take the work very seriously. So one thing that we do at the health district, which is the day you start getting paid is the day that you're a peer. You don't have to prove yourself to be seen as equal. And that has also been something that uh, Ryan's put a great deal of effort into in terms of quality, consistent training from the very beginning when people come on board, uh, which allows them to be very effective at, at providing services to the community. So we really uh, have been fortunate to adjust the way that we do hiring and, and service provision. Um, and, it's, and it's worked out exceedingly well. Thank you, Andre. Any questions for Sean? Hey, I have one follow-up question as we're talking about the, the private landfills. You know, I, I think they're what do you call them? C and D or construction and demolition? Focused, uh, uh, they're now known as limited purpose landfills. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you see any issues? I mean, since we talked about the fires, do you see any issues with batteries out there? We have not seen anything in our inspections that would indicate um, that there are batteries uh, being placed out there. There should never be anything of that right. nature being placed out there. Um, there is a very specific list for. Uh, listed out in each facility's permit of what they're allowed to take. Obviously, batteries would go to the moderate hazardous waste facility here in the county, but um, we if we ever saw anything, yeah. we would have them excavate that out and um, remove that from the landfill immediately. Okay, I'm just curious. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, next up, Public Health Partnerships, William Bravo. So I'm actually gonna take us back to PFAS very quickly just to give a quick update. Um, as we've referenced a few different times, there are some discrepancies between the federal limits and state limits in terms of uh, PFAS. And so with the sampling efforts that took place with the Army, there were about 35 households that were identified to fall within that discrepancy, as Sean mentioned. So today, actually, we'll be beginning our efforts to provide uh, filters to those households so they can begin to filtering their water, uh, PFAS specifically. Uh, we, in the next few weeks, we'll also be reaching back out to those same households to provide them point of use filters so they can apply those directly to their sink and have it be a little bit more um, easier for them to, to filter the water for other uses other than drinking as well. 
Uh, so we were able to do that work in partnership with the Washington State Department of Health. Um, at this point in time, it is limited to those specific households because that's what the funding is available for. But of course, we continue to uh, provide education to everyone else because we do know that it is uh, limited in terms of who's actually been tested. And we know that community members are concerned. Uh, but there, these are, uh, while these aren't, these uh, filters and filtration systems may not be accessible to everyone or even the cost of uh, testing their water, it is an option for those that are concerned. So we want to make sure that everyone knows about that, even if they don't fall within this particular grant at this time. Uh, so we'll definitely be letting everyone know how those efforts go. But um, we're three, three of the ladies here actually today will be doing those efforts, to, efforts this evening and making sure that we're going door to door to each and every one of those households to, to make sure they have that information available. Um, in other environmental health related news through the Department of, of Partnerships that we're working on, uh, we, as has talk, been talked about previously, we've been working on education efforts in the Lower Valley around nitrates and uh, water quality. And because of that, the State Department of Health reached out to the Yakima Health District to support us as they apply, well, to support our community as the Department of Health works with the Environmental Protect Protection Agency to apply to a three-year, $1 million grant uh, that would be uh, led by the Yakima Health District, but administered by the Washington State Department of Health. We've identified potential partners as Heritage University, Central Washington University, and Northwest Community Education Center, which is housed within Radio Acadia and Ace, specifically to work on, uh, in, on improving and expanding our education and outreach efforts around water quality issues, and also potentially including other environmental health hazards like air quality as well or around um, wildfire smoke for, for households. So we're excited about this opportunity that we've been identified as, as a key partner in this effort for our community, but also because it allows us the time to expand upon a model that we used previously throughout COVID, which was this community health worker model. Uh, we refer to it frequently as a promotora de salud model when it's with Spanish speaking communities, um, but it is the community health worker model, which is again, peer to peer education. Uh, we found this to be a best practice and we're uh, happy to be able to get this funding to continue to work in the lower valley around these long standing issues and hopefully provide a different approach that will uh, be effective in giving people the information they need to make the um, to make the, the choices that are going to be best for their family in terms of uh, how to consume their water and, and other uh, how to protect their family from other potential environmental health hazards as well. And outside of that, next week will be National Public Health Week. So National Public Health Week is April 3rd to April 9th. So it's a time where uh, we hope to teach more people about all the things that public health does. As I'm sure you all saw from the presentation today, there's a whole wealth of, inf of information and work that goes on at this health department, but in the field of public health overall, there's lots to learn. So if you're not already following us on our social media, as we keep talking about, we'll have little snippets of other work that we can highlight, both from the health department, but other work that's taking, across, taking place across the community that's related to, to the health of our community as well. Um, and then just a quick reminder that starting May 11th, the State Department of Health's at-home test kit uh, will no longer be in place. So if you wanted to have some at-home test kits through the State Department of Health mailed to your house, uh, please make sure to order those before May 11th. And again, all this information is available on our website. So if you can always uh, refer to people to, to our website or our social media, this is, we frequently bring this up just to offer some uh, good reminders for you all. Do you all have any questions? Any questions for Lillian? Okay, very good. All right, thank you, Lillian. Well, uh, that gets us to our report. So uh, we are to unfinished business. Do we have any unfinished business? All right. Then new business, any new business to be brought to the board's attention? Well, um, then at this point, I... I guess we uh, we can adjourn. Do we do we do this by vote here? Do we just or do I just declare it? Vote. I'll retain a motion then. To adjourn. Okay. <laughs> was, there, was there a second? I'm sorry. I'll second. Okay, very good. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor. All right. All right. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate uh, your attendance and participation today.